killer contortionists, blood-sucking creatures of the night, devil dolls, freaks of nature, diabolical schemers, pathological villains, and heroes. His ghoulish characters and twisted tales conjure up an image of the man as either the screen equivalent of Edgar Allan Poe or a pioneer in the craft of exploitation filmmaking. A man who truly let his hair down when it came to revealing his dark side to us on the screen, or a man whose artistic credo was that a sucker was born every minute, and who knew how to separate that sucker from his money with the lure of the unknown, the perverse, the forbidden. When it came to cinematic sensationalism and flirting with the taboo, this fear maker of the silent and early sound years had no peer. A son of the South, like his mentor, the legendary film pioneer D.W. Griffith, Charles Albert Todd Browning was born in Louisville, Kentucky on July 12, 1880. He left home at the age of 16 to join a traveling carnival. He was intrigued by the, the magic that it gave to the local people. You know, when it would show up, there was this mystic uh, magic about it in the sense that, you know, people would be buried alive or the wild man from Borneo or things like that, which, matter of fact, Browning was the barker for a sideshow, and they introduced a fellow as the wild man from Borneo, and it turned out to be a uh, black gentleman from Mississippi in heavy makeup. Browning quickly turned to performing, first as a clown, then as a contortionist and illusionist, on riverboat shows along the Mississippi. He soon joined vaudeville, where he performed the same acts on stage, as well as doing comedy, song, and dance routines. Browning met D.W. Griffith in 1913 and jumped at the chance to join the Griffith team as an actor, stuntman, and assistant director. When Griffith went west to make bigger pictures in the sun-drenched valleys of a place not yet famous as Hollywood, Browning went with him. During the period he was working for Griffith in California, Todd Browning was involved in a terrible car crash that catapulted his name into the headlines. A high roller and a gambler with a fondness for liquor and fast cars, Browning had plowed his roadster into a carload of street rails one morning on the way home from an all-night party. One of his passengers, Griffith actor Elmer Booth, was killed instantly. Another member of the Griffith team, George A. Siegman, was severely injured, as was Browning himself. The sensational accident slowed Browning up, but not for long. Less than a year after the crash, he was back behind the wheel acting the part of the speedster who races Mae Marsh to save her husband from the gallows at the conclusion of Griffith's epic film, Intolerance. It was a sensational and highly exploitable bit of typecasting to which neither Griffith nor Browning were oblivious. Browning co-directed his first feature-length film, the Civil War drama Jim Bloodsoe, the following year. Two years later, in 1919, he signed a contract with Universal to direct The Wicked Darling. The film marked the beginning of a relationship between Browning and an up-and-coming actor in the film's cast that would have a profound effect on the careers of both men. The actor's name, Lon Chaney. Revered as one of the silent screen's most gifted and versatile actors and the patron saint of the art of movie makeup, Lon Chaney specialized in roles that required him to disguise his features and contort his appearance to such an extent that he became known as the man of a thousand faces. In Todd Browning, Chaney found a writer-director eager to exploit his abilities in ever more sensational ways. Chaney played monsters and bad guys for other directors, but the Browning-Chaney collaboration was a unique one that sustained itself through 10 pictures, more than Chaney made for any other single director. It really was a rather interesting group of productions in here where Browning would dream up a character which had a double thumb and had to disguise himself because he had committed a murder and someone would recognize him. So he became an armless wonder. I mean, there's a strange type of mind that would create something like this. If you can find some of the silent Todd Browning movies that star Lon Chaney Sr., you really should look for The Unknown, which uh, co-stars Joan Crawford, uh, or West of Zanzibar. Um, I think if those movies were better known, uh, 
people would have a totally different idea about the history of horror movies. Too many people are hung up on the universal classics, the uh, Frankenstein, Dracula movies. These came years before that. They're, they're really a lot more inventive. They're, they're scary. Uh, Cheney plays these really twisted characters in Todd Browning movies. And um, no director has ever duplicated the uh, twisted scenarios in Todd Browning's silent movies. Browning said his films with Cheney seldom evolved in the traditional way. Rather than selecting the story first, he would come up with the concept of the type of role he wanted Cheney to play, then find or write a story to fit that role or roles. For in Browning's films, Cheney frequently played dual or multiple parts. In their film Outside the Law, for example, Browning has one Lon Chaney kill the other Lon Chaney. It's a really solid melodrama, crime melodrama, and very well made, Very moves very well, doesn't drag, and I think a film seen now, 70 years after its initial release, still holds the interest and still maintains the pace and the audience isn't falling asleep or getting bored. Well, that certainly speaks well of a picture. Browning wrote a vampire tale called The Hypnotist. It was filmed at MGM as London After Midnight, starring Lon Chaney in two roles, one of them a vampire, the other a detective. Typically, the film, which is now lost, presented the supernatural elements of the story as bogus come the final fade out. Unfortunately, as far as we know, it still does not exist. There was a, a print in the MGM vaults uh, up until the mid-50s, I believe, and then there was a fire at one of these vaults where the print exists and it was destroyed. I think that if, if that film were found, people would be essentially exceptionally disappointed in it because it follows basically the exact same plot line as Mark of the Vampire. Even if the film is great, you're going to be disappointed because of the, over the years the anticipation is built up to such an extreme that I, I don't think you could, you could have the best made film in the world and it'll still be a disappointment. Browning was also quick to recognize the box office value of having his man of a thousand faces appear without makeup, too. In the 1928 gangster hit The Big City, Browning drew kudos from the critics for shrewdly allowing Chaney to shine in a role without resorting to makeup tricks. When Lon Chaney died of throat cancer in 1930, Todd Browning lost his star actor, an actor who was not only willing but able to transform himself into whatever bizarre character Browning conjured up next. The picture Todd Browning is best remembered for was the 1931 version of Dracula starring, not Lon Chaney, but a Hungarian actor named Bela Lugosi. I am Dracula. A moment ago, I stumbled upon a most amazing phenomenon. Something so incredible, I mistrust my own judgment. Look. Dracula. The very mention of the name brings to mind things so evil, so fantastic, so degrading. You wonder if it isn't all a dream, a nightmare. Rats. 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 Thousands. Millions of them. Dracula was the film that launched the first great cycle of screen horror in the American cinema. Its greatness and the reasons for its unique position in the annals of screen horror are rooted in Browning's firm grasp of the film's most daring concept and his eagerness to exploit it. Browning knew what Dracula was really all about, eroticism and sex. He came to me. He opened the magnet in his arm. And he made me drink. Dracula gave him the opportunity to portray these elements in a story that was atypical of the American horror cinema up to that time. In most such films, the supernatural ingredients of the story were usually explained away in the end as fraudulent. Dracula was different. Here, the monster was real. Americans in the 20s in the Jazz Age did not believe uh, in, apparently in supernatural beings or, or th did not find those type of things 
entertaining from a certainly from a, a from a horror film standpoint but generally you've got a parade of cats and bats and other hooded figures through all the american films of the 20s that are purported to be old house horror films uh, haunted houses and such where the least suspected of the group is unmasked at the end uh, to be revealed as the cat or the bat or whatever. Dracula obviously was a milestone. It, it set up the horror genre. I think Dracula is certainly a great film. It's certainly an important film. It's really in some ways the most, the first modern horror film, I mean, as far as being a talkie as opposed to being a silent picture. Dracula was a project Browning had fixed on for years. He tried without success to purchase the screen rights to Hamilton Dean's stage adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel even before the play crossed the Atlantic and became a hit on the Broadway stage. Why is Dracula so stagey? I think what he was doing was giving the people in the motion picture theater the opportunity to see a stage play. So rather than having Dracula filmed uh, with the use of a lot of exteriors, you've got Dracula essentially as a stage play brought right into your local theater. Universal had signed Browning uh, to a three-picture deal, and this was a film that he was born to direct. He wanted Cheney, of course, and the unfortunate thing was that Cheney had passed away, uh, and he couldn't use him. We don't know what Lon Cheney's conception of Dracula would have been like had he made that with Browning, although we can tell from London After Midnight that he probably would have indulged in you know, some extravagant makeup effects, which of course Bela Lugosi did not do. And uh, Lugosi relied on uh, really his own presence and his own magnetism. Despite the sensation he caused in the role of Dracula, Bela Lugosi was neither equipped to step into Cheney's shoes, nor was he willing to try. Lugosi balked at the idea of disguising himself under pounds of makeup and lost the opportunity to advance his career as a major horror star in Frankenstein for that reason. Rather than keep searching for a new Lon Chaney, Todd Browning took a more sensational step. He cast his next film not with actors wearing makeup to look disfigured and crippled, but with sideshow performers whose twisted shapes and missing limbs were grimly real. The film was Freaks. Todd Browning's most outrageous movie is Freaks. Uh, nobody could top that. Freaks, I think, is one of the great films of all time. Um, again, because it breaks all the rules. I just saw Freaks the other night, and I, 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 I couldn't sit through it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it. One of the most interesting phenomena in Hollywood, uh, the beginning of the Great Depression, was the sudden popularity of, of horror movies. And Universal got the ball rolling with uh, Dracula, which Browning, of course, directed, as well as Frankenstein, and Paramount did Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, and MGM wanted to get on the bandwagon. And Irving Thalberg, who was the head of production there, basically got it into his mind that MGM would, you know, produce the horror movie to end all horror movies. And they uh, let Todd Browning loose on the project. And what they ended up was uh, doing freaks. Todd Browning was the type of a director that would leave the professionals alone. And that uh, on freaks, you're dealing with a carload of unprofessionals who are coming in who have the stigma of not looking normal to the great majority of other, other people at the studio. And, and he tried his best to be father figure to those people and to guide them through the roles and make the experience for them as pleasant as possible.
Audiences shun freaks. The illusion of Lon Chaney pretending to be armless and legless was one thing, but the sight of a real armless and legless wonder lighting a cigar with his teeth was quite another. Freaks drew heavy fire from state censor boards and critics all across the country. Here was a film that was banned in England for 30 years. Many cities where it played or tried to play wouldn't allow the film to be shown. Uh, censor boards, which were very popular back then, would ban this film altogether. We were told by, by one of the, uh, the MGM executives at the, the time that they had a preview in San Diego in which a woman ran screaming up the aisles and then threatened to sue MGM on the grounds that the film had given her a miscarriage. And um, so the film was kind of quietly taken out of circulation and um, MGM did not really reclaim the, the rights until decades later. You, you empathize very strongly with the, the little midget in that movie. You know, he, he manages to really, even though the, the other characters are so strange, you, you realize after a while that they're the good guys of this movie. And uh, it's the normal people, supposedly normal people, who um, are the ones that are the, are the true monsters. So it's, it's a brilliant film. The most interesting innovation of Freaks was that they were using real freaks. Uh, the studio was in a big to-do about this. I mean, you were having uh, lunch with uh, the half man who had no tor no, nothing below his torso. Uh, you know, people were not able to eat really around these folks. And they eventually uh, put them off in their own tent but the whole production of this thing was really monumental. I mean, the studio, the, the other producers at the studio trying to shut this thing down and Thalberg and Browning trying to keep it afloat. Uh, it's, it is true that it's a miracle that it ever got made. It was a box office failure, which MGM quickly pulled from release and shelved for years. The failure of Freaks was a calamity from which Browning's career never quite recovered. He'd been ahead of his time with this one the first great exploitation picture of the talkie era, and the Bible on a conceptual level for every fringe and exploitation filmmaker ever since. The only real exploitation film that he did was Freaks. Uh, the other one were really horror films. Uh, and exploitation only because of people's reaction to it and what they called it. Browning was never able to go quite as far again. In fact, he began looking backward and rehashing material he'd used before although he tried to spice it up a bit. He remade London After Midnight as Mark of the Vampire, adding a subplot involving incest. But the scenes were cut out by the studio prior to the film's release. The angel stalks through the night. No one is safe. Their fury would follow us to the ends of the earth. No, we must destroy them all together. They shall be found. Mark of the Vampire. His next thriller, The Devil Doll, a loose adaptation of A. Merritt's novel Burn Witch Burn, was highlighted by marvelous special effects.
but the story itself was little more than a throwback to Browning's most popular Lon Chaney film, The Unholy Three, which the team had made in 1925. Even Lionel Barrymore's master criminal in drag disguise was a reprise of Cheney's makeup in The Unholy Three. In a sensational statement by the prefect of police today, it was admitted that Paul Levon, former bank president, convicted of looting his own bank and killing a watchman, escaped from prison four months ago. <laughs> Thank you a thousand times, monsieur. You'll never know how happy it makes me to leave one of my dolls in your beautiful home. This is an authentic little replica itself. <laughs> Isn't it? Hello! Whatever you are, in God's name, listen and have mercy. I'll confess. The once vaunted Todd Browning, the cinema's master of sinister sensation, had become just one more hardworking stiff on the Hollywood assembly line. Browning's legacy is the cinema of, of alienation, the cinema of the outsider. You know, whether the outsider is a is a um, a criminal or a cripple or a supernatural vampire from Transylvania, it is this this sense of uh, of the social isolation and then the uh, the anger and frustration of that isolation. And uh, this is essentially the story he told over and over and over again. And, uh, and I think that accounts for why his, his films have not lost any of their fascination. I think you'll see that he was a good craftsman, did, came in, did his job, and went home, and he, he made some solid made pictures that still hold an interest. Todd Browning made his last film, Miracles for Sale, in 1939. It was a murder mystery with a magic show background. His instincts for sensation hadn't quite left him, however. For several years, he tried to get MGM to back a film version of Horace McCoy's taboo-breaking novel about the Depression, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? But it was not to be. In 1941, Todd Browning retired from the movie business, and he refused to discuss his career publicly for the remainder of his life.